All right, I have a quiz question for you. Pumpkins, are they fruit or vegetables? Interesting. That's what you think, huh? Interesting. Let's, let's find out. Well, it depends. The answer depends on whether you're talking about cooking or botany. Because in, depending on which category, category you're on, it's a fruit or a vegetable. Yes. So in cooking, vegetables are savory and fruits are sweet, generally. That's kind of just the general, general. But in botany, the fruit is the part of the plant that contains seeds and comes from the flower of the plant. So it depends on how that, what we call fruit or vegetable, grew to tell us whether it is a fruit or a vegetable. So the, the, a fruit is what comes, it contains the seeds and comes from the flower of the plant, and the rest of the plant is vegetable. So vegetables can be roots or stems or leaves of the same plant. So if a, plant, a, a single plant could produce some vegetables or could, could produce some fruit. So, lots of fruits are mistaken. I mean, uh, lots of vegetables are mistaken for fruits, but it doesn't usually go the other way around. So, pumpkins, tomatoes, peppers, and cucumbers are fruits. Shocking. Mind blown. Mic dropped. I know, you did not see that coming. Other surprises. This, this was new to me. Bananas, oranges, lemons, and limes are berries. They are types of berries, and our local chemistry teacher right here is shaking his head, affirming that everything I've researched on the internet is true. <laughs> nuts, nuts are a fruit, but a walnut is not a true nut. Wheat, rice, and oat grains are fruit. Winged maple seeds are fruit. Isn't that interesting to just think of it in a little different ways? So although you may not know whether something is a fruit or a vegetable, and it does matter what realm you're talking about, if it's cooking or botany, it, does, you know, it doesn't matter. But you can tell what kind of tree something is by its fruit. That is a little easier to connect those dots, a little easier to, to, to just see that connecting. So I, I've mentioned that uh, Pastor Shelley and I, we moved recently, and so we're still kind of getting used to everything at the new house. And there, was a, there is a tree that is hanging over the fence. And when I, I didn't really recognize it. I thought, is that a lilac bush? Or I, I, didn't, I didn't really know. What, what kind of tree was this kind of scruffy tree hanging over the fence? I had no idea, like, what, what is it? I was very glad, though, that it provided privacy, so that was kind of a nice thing. It was a, it's a barrier between, you know, the neighbors and everything just looking right, right there and stuff, so trees are kind of nice for that, until a couple days ago, I saw something, fruit. It is a plum tree. <laughs> I did not even know that. This is a picture of the actual tree, people, first seen right here on today's broadcast, today's service. And now, now that I know what kind of tree, I was really super excited. It, the the, the um, trunk is not on our side of the property, but I am told if the fruit's on my side, I can pick it. <laughs> so I fully intend to. Now I suddenly care about that tree. Like I know, I know what that tree is. And it made me mad that I saw several of the plums on the ground. Like, what? Have the, have the birds been attacking it? This is not okay. The, and that's wasted fruit right on the ground. I want to protect that fruit. I want to, like, develop it. Because I want those plums to get ripe. Right now, they're super hard. You know, not the, these, these kind. Those are the little, I think, Italian plums, little purplish plums. Uh, it's super hard right now. But I want them to tree ripen. Hello. That would be so awesome. I love it. So now that I know what that fruit is and what that tree is. I respond a little bit differently to it. So Jesus talked a little bit about fruit in the Sermon on the Mount. So that's where I was heading with this. There was a reason. So would you turn in your Bible to Matthew chapter 7, verses 15 to 23. And in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus has taken great care to teach you and me what it takes to enter the kingdom of God. Really, that's what he's been doing. And we've been studying and preaching from the Sermon on the Mount for about eight months. 
It's a lot. And he has been laying it out there. This is how you enter the kingdom of God. This is how you stay in the kingdom of God. If you are in the kingdom of God, this is how you act. These are the kinds of choices you make. And, and he's, he's laid it out there so clearly, and it's, it's, a, it's a lot. But in the final points of his sermon, which is where we are now, we're just in the last section of his, of his message, he lovingly warns you and me three different ways to make sure that nothing distracts you from the kingdom of God. So he's laid it out there. This is what the kingdom of God is. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of God. He lays it all out there. And, and now he's saying, please, please, I warn you, don't let anything distract you from being a part of the kingdom of God, from following God with all of your heart and soul and mind and strength. In last Sunday, in the message last Sunday, in that Bible passage, we looked at that first of three warnings that Jesus brings us at the end. And he challenged you and me to enter through the narrow gate, which is him, and follow him on the narrow path so that you end up with eternal life. So his first warning at the end of the Sermon on the Mount was sort of like, don't follow the crowd, follow the crown. Don't follow the crowd, follow the crown. So don't, just because everyone's on the wide path where everyone's going, everyone's doing it, don't go that way. Follow Jesus. Stay on the narrow path. Follow the crown. So today, a, a second warning that he's going to bring is don't follow blindly. Don't follow blindly. So we're going to look at Matthew chapter 7, starting in verse 15. Jesus says, beware of, or in other translations, this, this, this phrase is, watch out for, Beware of or watch out for false prophets who come disguised as harmless sheep but are really vicious wolves. And this is where we get this phrase, a, a wolf in sheep's clothing. So many phrases in just the common um, language that are from the Bible. I don't think people even realize it. But a wolf in sheep's clothing, this is where it comes from the Sermon on the Mount. So Jesus says, beware of those. Watch out for those. Verse 16, you can identify them by their what? By their fruit. By their fruit. That is, by the way they act. Can you pick grapes from thorn bushes? So can you get grapes off a blackberry bush? Or figs from thistles? Can you get figs like you make uh, fig newtons from? <laughs> can you get those from a weed? No, the, obviously the answer is, is no. A good tree produces good fruit, and a bad tree produces bad fruit. A good tree can't produce good, bad fruit, and a bad tree can't produce good fruit. So every tree that does not produce good fruit is chopped down and thrown into the fire. And then Jesus kind of sums this up before he goes on to explain it a little bit more this way. Yes. Just as you can identify a tree by its fruit, so you can identify people by their actions. And it was just the way it is with that tree at my house. I, didn't, I couldn't identify it. It was just some tree with leaves. Until I saw its fruit, then I went, ah, now I know what's really going on with that tree. That is a plum tree. I get it now. And Jesus says, watch out. Why would he say this? There's a warning in there. There's a protection for you. There is a love that Jesus has for you that he would say, listen, this, this is going to be bad for you if you don't watch out, if you don't stay aware, and, and be, on a, be on the alert for false prophets. And then he not only says this warning, hey, watch out, make sure that you don't get led astray by someone who says they're speaking the words of God into your life, but they're not, He's, he says, this is how you can tell. You can tell by how they act. You can tell by their fruit. And, and he goes on to explain in verse 21 a little bit more about that. He says, not everyone who calls out to me, Lord, Lord, or Master, Master, will enter the kingdom of heaven. So this is, a, this, is, this is a spoiler alert. Not everyone who says, I'm sent from God to tell you what's what in your life, not everyone who says that is sent from God. So Jesus is saying, don't be led astray. 
And he said, there's going to be a lot of people that say, Lord, Lord, I'm so glad to see you. And he's going to go, he's going to tell you what he's going to say. He says, only those who actually do the will of my Father in heaven will enter the kingdom of God. So he's saying, you can say whatever you want, but what are you doing? Are you living out the kingdom of God? Are you actually following Jesus in your practice, in what you do? And then Jesus looks ahead. He's the ultimate prophet, priest, and king. And he looks ahead and he says, this is what's going to happen. There is coming a judgment day. And on judgment day, verse 22, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, we prophesied in your name and cast out demons in your name and performed many miracles in your name. We did it all for you. But I will reply, I, I never knew you. Get away from me. You who what? Break God's laws. You who break God's laws. So a false prophet in those first few verses is he's kind of described further in these last few verses. Uh, a false prophet is one who says, we prophesied in your name. We exercised demons in your name. We did miracles in your name. It was for you, Jesus. We did it in your name. We did it for you, with you. But on judgment day, these false prophets say over and over, it was for you. I did great things for you. I had a great ministry for you. I operated in the gifts that you gave me. But unfortunately, Satan, the enemy, the devil, counterfeits. And we see uh, stories of this happening even in the Bible where he brings a counterfeit of God's good things, but he brings it for an evil intent, for his schemes, for his plans. In 2 Corinthians chapter 11, Verses 14 and 15, it says, even Satan, who is the prince of darkness, even Satan disguises himself as an angel of light. He is a wolf in sheep's clothing. And he disguises himself. He, he is darkness. He is the father of lies. But he comes and says, I'm telling you the truth. Verse 15, so it is no wonder that Satan's servants also disguise themselves as servants of righteousness. In the end, they will get the punishment their wicked deeds deserve. And I suspect that the Apostle Paul, when he wrote these words, as led by the Holy Spirit, was thinking about the Sermon on the Mount and Jesus' warning to us. I was thinking about Bible, um, just examples in the Bible where Satan counterfeited. Do you remember, you may, not, you may or may not know the story. If you've seen that animated uh, cartoon, The Prince of Egypt, you might know this story. Or if you've read the story of, of Moses in the Bible. Moses came before Pharaoh, the king of Egypt. And on behalf of God's people, the Israelites, he said, let my people go. And God, God, uh, God was encouraging Moses, and Moses ahead of time, and Moses said, well, what if they don't believe me? And God says, I'm going to do some miracles through, through you. Throw down your stick and speak to the water. And he, I'm going to do some miracles through you. And Moses goes, and he does those things. But Pharaoh's magicians, people who practice dark arts, counterfeited that, and they copycatted those miracles. They also made sticks turn into snakes and also made water turn into blood. Right. Satan can counterfeit God's good things, but he does it to subvert uh, what God is trying to accomplish. So just because someone is a gifted speaker or just because someone claims to be a prophet or because someone uh, performs a miracle, that does not mean conclusively that they are actually God's servant. So Jesus said, watch out. Beware. Yeah. Because false prophets are going to come. He says it in several places in the Bible. People are, are even going to come and say, I'm Jesus. I just came back. I'm Jesus. And Jesus warned us about that. He said, I'm, I'm telling you ahead of time so you know and you could be watching out. So what is, a, what is a false prophet? A, pro, a false prophet is someone who stands between God and people, and he, he says, I represent God, but he is acting falsely or deceitfully. 
A false prophet is someone who claims to be speaking for God, but who is not truly appointed by God, and who fails to follow Jesus, so uh, uh, he or she lives disobediently. That is a false prophet. So if someone claims to be your guide, okay, I, I am just going through the Sermon on the Mount. And I, one of the reasons I like doing this is because I wouldn't necessarily have chosen to preach on all these things, but I, I do want to bring the whole Bible to me and to us. And so it's kind of cool sometimes just to go, okay, we're just going to go through the whole thing and, and see what comes up. Um, I, though, in regard to this topic, have experienced this happening in churches where I have been or I have led. I have seen false prophets at work leading people astray. And so I am very passionate about this. I want to protect me and protect you from this happening. And it's cool because Jesus wants to protect us also. So if someone claims to be your guide, God told me this is what you're supposed to do. Or if someone claims to be your teacher or leader, just simply beware. They might be sent from God to speak to you. There are gifts of the Holy Spirit, gifts of a word of wisdom. That's for someone else. A word of knowledge. That's where God tells you something about, some, about some, someone else, about their life. So there, there is a true, legit, light-filled use of that. So we want to be open to a word of knowledge or a word of wisdom or discernment or faith or miracles or healing from another believer that comes to us. So I am not saying all prophets are false. Just simply saying, hey, let's beware. Does that make sense? Don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. We want all the gifts of the Spirit operating in our congregation, uh, within these walls and out on the streets. We want it all. But Jesus said, hey, 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 just setting a little boundary here. If a person is coming to you and saying, I'm speaking for God, but they are having a, an affair, they're a false prophet. So you, you, we, we've got to watch out for this. Jesus is saying, a person who is following Jesus, we all mess up. We all sin and we repent. Our trajectory is we're following God together. We don't have to be perfect to be used by God. But he is saying, watch out for people who are speaking into your life for false reasons. Yeah. Does that make sense? And Jesus said, the way you can tell, you can sleuth this out pretty quickly by how they live. That's how you can tell. God already knows because he sees their heart, but we don't. So we, we can only see what's on the outside. So just guard yourself, beware. Don't just accept everything that comes your way. But, but uh, if someone's speaking words uh, that they say are from God, start by checking the Bible. Like, does it agree with the Bible? Then that's a great place to start. That's a great place to start. The fruit that Jesus is talking about here, there's been a lot of debate about it, but he, 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 he defines it within those verses I read today. The fruit Jesus is talking about is doing God's will. That's the fruit. That's the fruit. So if, if you see someone, like for example, if someone messes up and they repent and they're moving forward, that's fruit. That's, that's right. It's not perfection. It's following Jesus. And it is doing the will of God. He said, only those who actually do the will of my Father in heaven will enter. And he's talking about the kingdom of heaven. So the false prophet could be a gifted leader, but he or she is not actually living out their walk with God in their daily life. They might have a, 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 a public life that shines and a private life that stinks. They might, might do a good job in ministry, but their moral life looks just like any other regular person. So some questions to ask, do, does, that, does that person love their neighbor as themselves? How would that prophet's next door neighbor describe them? Would they describe them as loving, as godly during the week when they're not on stage? Do they treat people the way they'd want to be treated? Or do they take advantage of the vulnerable? I'm irritated about this because I know of this happening. Do they associate with people who are beneath them? Do they read their Bible and pray and grow in their own relationship with Jesus? Do they tell others how to live their lives, but their own life is out of control? I have seen charismatic leaders, whether they're on stage or not, I've been kind of saying stage, but it doesn't have to be on stage, <laughs> do a lot of damage 
in the body of Christ because they're not following Jesus themselves. So if someone says, I believe that God has knit us together, you are called to me. If a leader or another spiritual person says, I I believe God says you are called to follow me, can I just say right now, please run the other direction? You're not called to follow Garen. You're not called to follow me. I'm calling you to follow Jesus. That's who we follow. That's who we give our lives for. We don't, we don't go and follow a person over Jesus. Beware if someone says to you, God said you're supposed to do such and such or go to such and such place. Really, if, if we're talking about a, a major life change, this should be a confirmation of something God's already speaking to you. Right. And that's a really cool, positive way that the good gifts of the Spirit work right. in your lives. You've, you've been feeling like, man, I just feel like God wants me to go and be a missionary. And you've just been wrestling with God, like, is this you, God? Am I hearing it? And, and then someone comes to you and says, you know, I've been praying, and I just feel like God has given me a message that you're supposed to be a missionary. Then you go, wow, God's already been saying it. Now I have another confirmation, like, I, my ears are perked. Are you going to open other doors, Lord? Is this really you? That's how we approach it. That is being aware, be, being aware. Take it to the Lord in prayer. Let's be wise. So if you hear someone claiming to speak for God, observe their life to see, is that person doing God's will? Uh, If so, then they might actually be speaking for God. Perk up, listen, absolutely. But if not, Jesus said they're a false prophet. You can spare yourself so much pain if you will just beware. So bottom line of this message is when choosing whom you follow, obedience trumps giftedness. When choosing whom you're going to follow, obedience trumps giftedness. In 1 Samuel chapter 15, an Old Testament prophet, Samuel said, listen, obedience is better than sacrifice and submission to God is is better than offering the fat of rams. So he was a prophet in Israel where they are, their worship was bringing sacrifices to God and, and the best lamb from their flock and the best bull and the best goat and, and stuff like that. So when he says submission is, to God is better than offering the fat of rams or obedience is better than sacrifice, he's talking about you can do the forms of worship, but God is looking for your heart to follow him. That, that's what he's looking for. He wants your obedience more than just simply doing things for him. Author Scott McKnight says, works tell the truth. Works tell the truth. Your behavior, your actions tell the truth. My grandma used to say, actions speak louder than words. I think that came from the Sermon on the Mount, I'm pretty sure. No one is saved by your works. But everyone is judged or will be judged by your works. The Bible has a lot to say about that, and I don't even have time to get in all. But there will be a judgment day, even for believers like you and me. And all the things that we did for God are going to be laid there. And he's going to bring a heavenly torch to it and see what was actually done for God and what was actually done for flesh, for fame, for power, for manipulation, of taking advantage of others. He's going to set fire. And if your faith is in Jesus, you're going to be saved. But I think it's uh, Third John that says, but barely. <laughs> barely. I want to be in the barely category. I want to be in the fully in their category. And I, I hope you do too. <laughs> all of us tend to put ourselves into a Bible story when we read it. I don't know if you, if you are aware of this, but as you're reading a Bible story, you, you either identify with a character or you identify with Jesus, if Jesus is in the story. I can tell you pretty much any teacher or pastor, we identify with Jesus in the story because Jesus is the one instructing people. And so we kind of identify with him and we can let ourselves off the hook. But Jesus says, watch out 
don't you be deceived either. So beware of others deceiving you, but also don't you be deceived. Don't, don't let yourself get to heaven and say, Jesus, I'm all that in a bag of chips. And Jesus said, I don't know you. Like, so I've got to check myself. You've got to check yourself. we all got to check, check ourselves. We will all be judged. So what can we do from this message? Just a couple of action steps come to my mind. The first one is this. And inspect another's fruit before you buy it. Inspect another's fruit before you buy it. Um, stop. Think. Pray. Open your Bible. If someone is saying, God says this, open your Bible and find out, does he really? Paul uh, commended uh, people in this one city, the city of Berea, because he was like, man, you guys take every sermon I preach and you go look in the Bible and see if it's true. Good job. Let's be like that. Let's be like Bereans if someone's speaking into you. Um, uh, th this past week, I really needed a milkshake. <laughs> and <laughs> so Pastor Shelley and the, were in the car. Uh, we had been to a, a, a service at another church, and, and we're, we were like, I, I need a milkshake. So we go to McDonald's. I'm sorry, sir. We're out of milkshake mix. We go to the second McDonald's. I'm sorry, sir. We're out of milkshake mix. Go to the third McDonald's. Sorry, sir, we're out of milkshake mix. Finally, we get to another city and go to that McDonald's. And I said, I want a milkshake? He goes, yeah, sure. And anything else? I said, you have them? He, I, I said, this is the fourth McDonald's we've been to, and they've all been out of milkshake mix. And you know what he says? I don't buy it. I thought that was a really interesting response from the, the order taker in the window. I don't buy it. He's, he listened to what I said, and he's evaluating it. And maybe he knows stuff I don't know. I don't know. But I, that just reminded me of this message when I got to this message. I don't buy it. Like, wow, way to stop and think before you just accept what any old customer you've never met just says to you in the drive-thru. Mm. The second action step is this. And this is good for all of us. Live in the light of Judgment Day. Live now in the light that a Judgment Day is coming. And as I preach this, I hope you know me well enough by now to say, to know that I am saying simultaneously, Garen, live in the light of Judgment Day. And I am constantly feeling convicted by the Holy Spirit of stuff in my life. I am constantly working on it, and I am not there. I am not all that in a bag of chips. I am working on my own stuff, sometimes really hard. And I, I hope you will too. Let's all be a church that lives in the light of Judgment Day. Uh, we do it in other areas. You know, we, we, we stop and we think, man, should I continue this habit like of smoking or something like that? Uh, when I know that down the road, maybe I don't feel all the effects now, but down the road, um, there could be a judgment day in my lungs. So we, we, we make some choices like that now in light of future judgment. Let's also consider the judgment before Jesus Christ, King of kings and Lord of lords. There is a judgment day coming. I don't want to be embarrassed about my works. My faith is in Jesus, so I'm going to heaven. And if your faith is in Jesus, you are too. But I want to, I, I want to bring Jesus gold and silver and precious stones kind of works from a good heart, from a pure motive, uh, and as led by God. And that's what I want for you too. I, th I was thinking about Judgment Day, and recently I did an online course. It was just a few weeks. And at the end of the course, we, there was a 20-question quiz. And I, I had... I had studied, I knew the material, I breezed through that. Uh, yep, 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 yep. I just, it took me three minutes to take that 20 minute quiz and I was very confident in it. I thought, I, I know I got everyone right because I, I, I knew this material and I, I understood those questions, absolutely. And when I got the results back, I had missed question number 20. So I only got a 95. And the, the reason is because I misread the question. I didn't understand what was being asked of me. So therefore, I missed it. 
So we have an opportunity. We've been going through the Sermon on the Mount. We know what is being asked of us. You know. You know the life Jesus is calling you to. You know. And so let's prepare for that final exam because we do know what's already going to be on it. Jesus said two essay questions in today's passage, two essay questions. Number one, do I know you? Number two, did you obey God? That's, you already know what's on the test, so study for it. Study for those two things. Press into Jesus' presence. Be at, be at uh, worship service every single week. Uh, open your Bible every day. Pray every day. Know Jesus and do his will. There you go. It's just, it's just there, there's the, we, we know what's on the test. And on that day, for you and me, obedience trumps giftedness. So all that's left is to perfectly follow Jesus, everything that he said. That's it. That's all you got to do. Just perfectly follow all those eight months of teachings from the Sermon on the Mount. Do God's will completely. But can we be real? You cannot. I cannot. We cannot follow it perfectly. It's too much. It's too hard. We're too carnal. We have too much baggage. We cannot obey God perfectly. No one can. So you and I deserve to hear Jesus say on Judgment Day, get away from me, you who break God's laws. We deserve to be condemned. Think about it. But Jesus did obey the Father's will completely and perfectly. He lived a sinless life. And he was the only one, the only person that the Heavenly Father ever said to, to someone, you followed my will perfectly, so you're going to be condemned. You're going to hang on a cross. You're going to die a criminal's death. But Jesus obeyed anyway, and he paid for his, with his life for all the times that you and I fall short. So start with Jesus. Follow Jesus. Rest in Jesus. Obey in Jesus' strength. Follow Jesus. That's the only way you or I have any chance of making it to heaven, is if all of our faith is in Jesus, we start there, then we work it out in his strength. Does that make sense? You can, you and I, we can't do it on our own, but we can rely on Jesus' strength and we can live a godly life. We can, we can in him. The only way to begin to obey the Father's will is to start with Jesus. Would you stand to your feet in this room and if online if, if that's where you're at? And we want to pray. So would you just bow your heads with me for a moment? And let's pray. Jesus, you gave us a warning in this passage, so we want to heed that warning. And we just pray, Lord, that you would help us to spot the false prophet. Lord, that we would not just buy everything we see uh, on the internet, that we would not believe every online message, that we would not believe every person who comes to us and says this or that, un unless, Lord God, they are following you, living for you, and what they say agrees with your word. Lord, so help us to be wise. You told us to beware. Help us to beware. Holy Spirit, make us sensitive. And Lord, on the flip side, I pray that we would be open to every gift that is from you, from the Holy Spirit. Every good teaching we see on the internet or in church, every encouraging word or even a word of wisdom or knowledge from a friend in church, Lord, that we would be open to that. So the two sides of the same coin, Lord, help us to beware and help us to be open to you doing what only you can do in our lives. Lord, help us to live in light of the judgment day. Lord, help us not live willy-nilly. Help us not to live by default. Help us not to coast through life. But help us to, help us to live wisely, not, not in fear and trembling of judgment day, but just wisely in light of judgment day so that every one of us would be ready. That's what I pray, Lord, that every one of us would be ready on that day. Pull back the curtain on deception and reveal your truth, Lord God, in our lives. In Jesus' name. And I want to give you an opportunity if you've never put your faith in Jesus or if it's time for you to come back to him, to do that now. Would you, would you bow your heads with me one more time? And even online, here in the room, I want to ask you, are you ready for judgment day? Are you following Jesus? Are you resting in him? Are you um, d depending on your own goodness because that's going to fall short? Or are you putting your faith in Jesus? I want to invite you to put your faith in Jesus. Turn from your sin. 
Turn your life over to God and let him lead. If, if you're here in the room and you, you're ready to do that today, you want to put your faith in Jesus, would you just raise your hand so I would know specifically who to pray for? Uh, good. And I, I see some hands going up, and that, that's awesome. That, that's really good. I, some people just making sure that you're right with God, and God loves that so much. He loves your honesty, and he sees your hands. Online, you can raise your hand to God, too. I can't see it but God can. Let's all pray after me, and I'm just going to lead you in a prayer. And if you got your hand up, that tells me that there is some question in your mind that you are right with God. And I just want to encourage you, you can know right now if you simply put your faith in Jesus. You can know that you are saved and then you can begin to walk with him in confidence, all right? So would you repeat after me online or in the room, would you repeat after me, Jesus, Jesus. I invite you into my life. Please forgive me of my sins and make me new. I choose to follow you, to start with you, to rely on you, to depend on you, to help me follow you, starting now, in Jesus' name, amen, amen. And if you just put your faith in Jesus online or in the room, man, we just applaud you, and we say yes, yes, that is awesome. So if you did, would you just let me know by te text the word restart to that same phone number we've been talking about, 97,000. Text the word restart because you're restarting your life. And let me know you made that decision today. And I, I just, I, I, I know I'm always over time. But here, here's the thing. I just got to tell you. Um, several of you have raised your hand for the second, third, fourth, fifth, tenth time. And that is awesome. But I just want to assure you, if you have put your faith in Jesus if you are doing your best to follow him, if you're trusting him for salvation and not your own goodness, you're saved. Amen. You're saved. You are going to heaven. Absolutely. So you don't need to keep getting saved over and over again, but what you do need to do is, just like we did at communion today, is repent yeah. over and over again. Yeah. I repent daily, weekly. <laughs> you do need to repent, but you don't need to get saved over and over. I don't often take the time to say this, but I want to assure you with that, okay? You don't have to get saved over and over again, but you do need to repent. Repent is, I know I did wrong. Please forgive me. Help me to go the opposite way. Help me to, that's, that's what repenting is. Amen? Amen. Amen. God bless you. Thank you, thank you Pastor Garen. You know, I've, um, I've watched Pastor Garen and Pastor Shelley over the past year and just seeing how the Word of God changes them. And they don't, you know, a lot of pastors, it's so easy to be like, it's hard-hearted, staunch, this is the way it is. But I have just seen a sensitivity of heart in both of them that has just made it so easy to follow them. And, um, sorry. <laughs> I love you guys. And, um, the fruit of your life is that sensitivity and that willingness to change and that willingness to listen to the Lord and listen to his guidance and be completely submitted to him. And it's a wonderful thing. And I follow you guys because of it. So, oh man, <laughs> I love you guys. Well, if it's your first time, I'm going to try and get through this. If it's your first time coming here today, uh, would you just text Crete to 97,000? And um, if you're joining us online, um, we just encourage you to subscribe to our channel. It helps people to find us and helps people hear the good news of the gospel, which people need to hear. And um, I look forward to seeing you next week. If you can, and change plans, please. Stay after service. Stay after service to help us set up for VBS. We need all the hands that we can get. Lots of people. Lunch will be provided. If we don't have enough lunch, we'll go to Little Caesars or something, okay? We'll make it happen. All right. Love you guys. See you next week.